I'm Alan Gingell from the Crawford School and the HC Coombs Policy Forum and it's a great pleasure for us to have here in the studio at the University today Jean-Marie Guilleno who is the CEO and President of the International Crisis Group. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to Canberra Jean-Marie. Um, uh, for those who don't know the International uh, Crisis Group, I think it's one of the most innovative and interesting non-governmental organisations uh, around and I want to ask you about that uh, very shortly. But it certainly needs someone in charge of it who has a very distinguished uh, background in some very difficult issues including international diplomacy, uh, conflict resolution and uh, peacekeeping. And they couldn't have chosen uh, better than, uh, than uh, Jean-Marie who comes to the job most recently uh, from a position as professor at Columbia University and director of the Centre for Conflict Resolution there. And before that, from, from a uh, distinguished and I think record-breaking stint as Under Secretary General of the United Nations for peacekeeping operations between 2000 and 2008, and even earlier than that, uh, you're in the uh, French Foreign Service, uh, including a stint as uh, Head of Policy Planning uh, uh, there. Uh, so all of that uh, shapes up to uh, prepare you very well for the very difficult task you've, uh, you've now got. And I wanted to begin by asking if you could say something about the ICJ and what it does and how it does it. Well, Crisis Group was uh, created as a reaction to the policy failures of the Yugoslav Wars a sense that many conflicts uh, develop and uh, get terrible for the population because of ignorance and indifference. And if you could fight ignorance and fight indifference, you could make progress. And so the, the concept of crisis group is pretty straightforward, is to have analysts in the conflict areas or close to the conflict areas, developing a analysis that is objective, that is impartial, and then not stopping there, um, making sure that we have policy recommendations and that we push for those policy recommendations with any uh, country, any actor, any stakeholder who can influence the conflict. I'd like to say that Christ Group, in a way, is the foreign ministry of all those with no foreign ministry. We are not, our job is not to defend a particular national interest. Our job is to speak for all the people who are the victims of conflict and uh, propose and push for practical, pragmatic solutions that end the conflict or prevent it. It, uh, it seemed to me in a lot of the jobs I've had that the work of the uh, of crisis group uh, was in some ways reminiscent of quite old fashioned skills which you no longer see from diplomatic reporting and even from, uh, from newspaper reporting. You've, you've got people on the ground uh, in, in, the, uh, in the areas uh, doing that job and then, as you say, turning it into uh, uh, recommendations. Who is your main audience for all of this? Well, the main audience is, of course, I mean, the, all the uh, foreign ministries of uh, concerned countries are very interested in what we say. Uh, the parties to conflict are very interested in what we say because they, they know that they will hear from us the unvarnished truth and they often search themselves for solutions and uh, we engage with them and try to convince them uh, to find a solution. And then, of course, the general public who wants to make sense of this world I mean, comes to crisis group mm -hmm. reports because they offer objective analysis. You're going to be talking uh, tonight about reconfiguring the international response to, uh, uh, to conflict. Uh, why is such uh, reconfiguration required and what does it involve? Well, we have been used to a world with, where conflict was essentially state-to-state -state conflict and where the number of powers that really uh, uh, structured uh, the international scene was fairly uh, limited. It was essentially a top-down world with the states are the, as the pillars. Mm. And now we are seeing a much more bottom-up world where events, uh, circumstances often dictate the reactions of states, where states uh, are often overwhelmed by what mm -hmm. uh, is happening, and where the number of states involved is much greater than it used to be. 
So a world in which 30, 40 states operate uh, follows quite different uh, rules and different processes than a world in which a handful of states are really uh, the dominant powers. Yeah. You, you wrote recently, um, throughout the world, it seems crisis is, uh, is gripping national politics. Uh, and for any Australian uh, over past weeks would, I think, uh, uh, recognise all of that. How, how do you define this crisis and what does it matter to conflict resolution? Well, uh, I think that politics were always defined in the confines of the nation state and the notion of a public space in which you compete for political programs was really strongly embedded. Now you see a number of actors uh, who transcend states and you see a great skepticism on the notion of a comprehensive political program. Mm. That is in part the result of the end of the Cold War, which was in a way the end of ideologies, uh, where you had strong ideologies structuring po political life. Uh, now that's uh, come to pass. Mm. And so, yeah. but that doesn't mean that people don't want to act collectively, but they are less looking for political answers. Hence, a crisis of in many uh, in many countries of politics. You see in Europe a great fragmentation of politics, a sense of impotence of uh, politics, and uh, the darker side of that is how extremist movements. Uh, extreme, uh, extreme uh, fundamentalism, especially uh, Islamist uh, fundamentalism, then uh, provide a, a cheap and most dangerous outlet to a sense of uh, lack of purpose, lack of collective purpose of disenfranchised people. Mm. You've already mentioned that one of the distinctive features about the current international uh, system is the uh, is the emergence of uh, <coughs> non-state actors, and you've talked about uh, fragile states and ungoverned spaces, which obviously preoccupy a lot of crisis groups' work. Um, in this part of the world, uh, we're highly conscious too of another feature of the current international uh, system, which is uh, the emergence of a strong state um, in uh, China with growing international influence, not just mm -hmm. in our part of the world. I wondered if I could ask you how you see China currently and in the future contributing to global order and conflict resolution and the issues that mm -hmm. Crisis Group is interested in. Well, I have seen uh, China gradually taking a more assertive role. I saw it in peacekeeping where I saw the growth of Chinese participation in peacekeeping wanting to show that it could be a good uh, citizen uh, of the world. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, it is not yet clear how China will integrate in the multilateral uh, system, which requires to have a, a fundamentally symmetrical view of uh, international relations, mm. not a hierarchical uh, view. And uh, China there is in a way, there is a, there is a tension between its sense that it has to become a global power, uh, its uh, desire not to have enemies, which means also not to have allies, as they say, <laughs> mm. Um, mm. and which means that uh, China is hesitant uh, to take on strong positions. Uh, at the same time, it needs a stable world, and it's now too big to just abstain. Mm. And so I think in the, uh, we, we see conflicting signals in a way coming uh, from China because it is pursuing different objectives. On the one hand, it wants to remain uh, in a, way a quiet uh, power that doesn't, that doesn't rock the boat. Uh, at the same time, it sees a world in which precisely there are fragile state, there are situations where abstention is not uh, mm. a, an answer. It's certainly concerned about the, ri the rise of jihadism. It sees that if you don't deal with those weak states where jihadism can take hold, then jihadism could strike home. And so that challenges, in a way, fundamental concepts of sovereignty for China and the balance between engagement and uh, abstention. And I don't think China at this stage has found the full answer yet. It's, it's looking for it. 
One of the things that you, uh, uh, jobs that you had uh, before you uh, you uh, uh, took this was as a special envoy for both the Arab League and the United Nations in dealing with uh, mm. uh, Syria. Um, that <laughs> jihadism and those whole issues which are as you were saying, directly um, relevant to China and to the and to the to the rest of the world, uh, come together uh, very much there. What hope do you see now for the situation there? Well, uh, I was working on uh, directly on Syria in two thousand twelve, and uh, it would have been less difficult in two thousand twelve mm -hmm. to reach a settlement than now, because the more a conflict endures, whether it is in Syria or in Somalia or in uh, South Sudan, the more we see a tendency to fragmentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and today, mm -hmm. Syria is infinitely uh, fragmented, mm -hmm. which means that uh, today we cannot be looking for the kind of comprehensive ceasefire that we tried in 2012. It failed in 2012, but it barely failed. There was a moment of hope. Uh, certainly today, to try for a comprehensive ceasefire in Syria would be is uh, un completely unrealistic. And so that is why the, uh, the present special envoy of the United Nations, uh, Stefan de Mistura, is trying for what he calls local freezes. And uh, he has focused on a freeze in Aleppo. And we at Crisis Group had drawn attention to, uh, to, to Aleppo. Um, at the moment, uh, these efforts are not yet succeeding because both camps still believe that they can win. Uh, I believe, and I think our analysts at Crisis Group believe that there is more and more a stalemate, but there is not among the parties a perception of a stalemate, sadly. Uh, and so long as there is not the perception of a stalemate, uh, then the fight goes on, as each side believes it can crush the other. Certainly, that is the belief of the Syrian government in Aleppo, and uh, the opposition, uh, the mainstream opposition, I'm not talking about al-Nusra or the Islamic State, mm -hmm. but the mainstream opposition in the South may think that it has momentum and that can have uh, further gains. And so uh, that, that prevents uh, progress on, uh, on local freezes. I think eventually there will be uh, such uh, freezes. Uh, and the question will be then in which national uh, framework uh, uh, I believe that the talk about uh, breaking up uh, Syria is very dangerous. Uh, I think the Syrians want Syria to stay uh, a unified uh, country, but certainly it will require much devolution of power, local security arrangements, and very solid security guarantees, that, which probably mean that the various groups will need to be sure that they have a uh, some kind of control over part of the security establishment because they won't believe in just words. Uh, and I'm afraid this uh, solution is still far off. Okay. On that rather pessimistic note, let me thank you very much, uh, Jean-Marie Guillena, for joining us here at the ANU. Thank you. Thank you.